going to be on the PM 1228 Precision Matthews lathe. Uh, I spent many years uh, switching lathes. I started out with a small Craftsman and I went to a, uh, a South Bend, which was a 12 inch lathe. It was pretty worn out. And from that, I went to a Grizzly. And all of them worked, but uh, some of them didn't work very well. And by the time I got to the fourth lathe, I knew what I wanted. And the first thing that I wanted was a variable speed reversible motor. And because I do a lot of tapping and it's just light tapping, it's not, you know, model making, it's nothing complicated. And I zeroed in on this Precision Matthews lathe because of the features. And believe me, it has some really nice features, although I think they could have done a lot better in their manufacturing and they could have got a lot more out of this lathe with very little effort. Uh, I've made quite a few changes and uh, I'll go through them one at a time. First, uh, first thing I did was add uh, the digital readout to the tailstock and I came up with this when I had some work I was doing for somebody and it was a lot of drilling and I realized once I put it on there and took that wheel off, I never put the wheel back on. It's much easier to drill holes with a lever like this and I very seldom turn between centers or anything like that, so it's, uh, it just stays on there, and I love it. Uh, then another thing I did, of course I don't have a digital readout, so I put the uh, micrometer stop, and this micrometer works in two ways. It's, it shows me the, the position of the, the carriage, and also it's a stop. When I put it there, I can use it as a stop, it doesn't jam because I have made this piece here and that's what it hits. So it works as a stop as well as a uh, digital read. I have this micrometer stop and you all know how this works. And that, it's, it's quickly to, quick to a set, quick to set because of this lever. I use that all the time. And of course I changed to a, uh, a quick change tool post. Now, when I first got the lathe, if you turn this, it was very, very hard to turn and it was jerky. So I did some reading and I found a guy that he made a gearbox that made this four to one. And so I looked around and I had some gears and this is now a three to one gearbox on this. So you have to turn it more but it's a lot more precision and it's easier to turn and it isn't jerky. And it's just three gears down in here to do that. And it was something that I had around and they worked pretty good. Uh, if you use two gears, it's gonna be turning the wrong way. You won't like that very much. So you have to use three gears. You put an idle gear in between and the handle will turn the really same way. quiet lathe and that's what I like about it because it's not gear driven, it's belt driven. And uh, I had that with the Grizzly, but when you engage the power feed and you were running the gear train, the thing sounded like a thrashing machine. So uh, I wanted something that's, that was quiet and most of the write-ups said this was quiet and it is quiet. And I'll run it here in a few minutes and you'll see. But uh, what I really like about it is the variable speed in reverse. As you can see, I can run this really slow for tapping and I can reverse it back the tap out you know I put the tap in here and it's it's very nicely and if I want to speed up backing it out I can do that it doesn't have a lot of torque when it's in slow speed but that doesn't matter to me because like I said I'm just a model maker I make small engines and most of my parts are very small I use probably this much of the lathe and the rest of the, the bed is just to park the tailstock and get it out of the power way. feed here so you can hear the, the difference in the sound. So that's, that's the lathe running. that's with the power feed engaged. And as you can see, it's not very noisy. The 
You can hardly hear the gears, you hear the whir of the lathe, but not the gears. Now, another thing that I changed was in order to reverse the power feed, what you would have to do is open this cover up, loosen this Allen screw, switch from forward to reverse or put it in neutral, and then close the cover because it had an interlock here, which I have removed. Actually, the interlock isn't removed, it's down here. But uh, I just stick that in there and it runs the lathe. Because disconnecting it would mean I'd have to take this all apart, so I didn't. And somebody might want to re-engage it someday, so it's still there, but it got in the way of this. So I put a handle on this, I put a little detent, and you can see the... So all I did was, this has a little spring underneath it, and this in a washer. And there's a detent ball here that's also on a spring, and it's adjustable through here. So when I switch it, it, it locks in, because it won't go in unless the lathe is running a little bit. There. That's neutral. And that's uh, what I call forward. It's to the chuck, and up is away from the chuck. And I've marked that here on here, so I don't forget. Overall, the lathe is perfect for what I do. And another thing that I didn't mention was the chuck. Uh, it's a, a quick release D1 chuck. And you just do that. Now this chuck is on there pretty tight. So I, I have to tap it a little bit for it to come out completely, which is because of the taper. When I first got this, the taper on the lathe wouldn't seat. And I, I, doing my checks, I found out that this was wobbling a little bit and I couldn't figure it out. So I went to take this off. It was so tight that I, I couldn't turn it. So I stuck a piece of pipe on the end and I, I got it loose. And then the chuck was, of course, seized on here practically. So uh, I called them up and I talked to them and they weren't much help. But uh, I, after thinking about it, I figured to heat the chuck up. So I took an electric heater and I put it here and I got the chuck w really hot, warm from an electric heater. And then I tapped it and it came off. So I told them what the problem was, this taper was too big. And what he told me was to file the back plate till it fit. And I'm thinking, I can't do that. And you know, there's no way in heck you could file a back plate to fit. So I thought about it for a while. And what I came up with finally was I took a piece of brass. It was very small and I could hold it in my fingers, run the lathe, and I put a piece of uh, emery, fine emery paper on it and held it on here exactly that angle. Because I only had to take off about two tenths of a thousand, two one hundred thousandths of an inch. Because the chuck was only out five thousandths. And if you do the math, you'll find out that taper. It's very, very slight that you have to take off. And now it fits perfect. And if you look at it, you can see that it's hitting 99 percent of the taper. So it didn't it didn't throw it off at all, and I get good runouts on my chucks because I have uh, six six different back plates, and I would have had to uh, modify six back plates to fit the spindle that was wrong, and so I did the spindle instead. In in working on this, I found that uh, the way this was marked was a little confusing for me because it's A C B. And what that does is it changes the speeds. The slowest speed is one, the second fastest speed is B, and the, th the third fastest is C. So I just changed it to a one, two, three. And it's, it makes it easier for me to, to look at it and understand it. And you'll also see that I put on here, that's away from the chuck and that's to the chuck. So I don't have to think. And obviously you can 
put this or change the speed when it's running, as long as it's running slow, you wouldn't do that at high speed, but at low speed it's not a problem. The belt drive, it has two different speeds with the belt. I seldom ever use the high speed. Now I'll run this up full speed with a low speed. And it's running a uh, thousand RPMs now. And a thousand RPMs is, is good for most of what I do. Uh, once in a great while I do something that's real small and I want to take some fast light cuts and I do switch the belt. But it's very, very seldom that I have to switch the belt over. I'll show you the alignment of the, uh, the spindle and I'll put a dial indicator on it and you can see how good it is. Let's got to take the chuck off first here. This won't go back far enough. So what you have to do is loosen these screws up and fortunately this thing is movable. So you can move your compound back if you have to really get back. Gotta go back a little more. Now this dial indicator is, is very delicate. It's, this is one thousandth of an inch. It's in ten thousandths. I'll turn it on here. Now there's a little bluing on this, so I bet you that's screwing it up. So you can see if, if I turn that by hand and let it go, it's, it's within two tenths of a thousand. See, it even chatters when I do that. But when I let it go, it always goes back to almost the same place. It's within two tenths of a thousand. Okay. This is the face, and this is what uh, lines the chuck, uh, keeps it flat against this surface. And this is what makes it accurate. Put this on the outside there's some holes in here so I have to run just the outside but as you can see that's almost perfect it's 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 probably wavering uh, one ten thousandths of an inch and uh, very very flat it's a little better than the taper but it's excellent I mean I'm very happy before with it. I had uh, three lays prior to this and uh, I accumulated some test equipment and one of the things I accumulated was this test bar, bar because I had to set the Grizzly two or three times because it would go out of alignment and I don't know why it was had an adjustable head on it. So I'm going to put this in there. This bar is supposed to be accurately ground so I'm assuming that it is and this is my test bar I've used this on two lathes now and it, it works out pretty good for setting up the lathe I'm going to turn this on and we'll run this dial indicator in there and this is out 12 inches and as you can see it's just about a thousandth of an inch in 12 inches and that's that's pretty true. It's, I, I'm actually amazed it's that good <laughs> in 12 inches. I've never had anything on my other lays even close to that. So now we're going to check it right up against the chuck. Let me put a little oil on it here. I'll turn that on. As you can see, it's maybe three tenths of a three ten thousandths of an inch not quite about two and a half ten thousandths of an inch so 
the next thing we'll do is we'll run it back and forth and see. So I'm going to put this on zero. We'll run it out here. And that shows two thousandths and twelve inches. Okay, now I'm going to rotate this. And there's the one thousandth of. Right there, it's only a thousandth out and twelve inches there. That's pretty doggone good. I, just, I aligned this myself because it was out about eight thousandths when I first got it. But this is this is still acceptable. Is most of the things I bore are less than three inches deep, and I get less than a, a half a thou or a quarter thou in taper, and that's quite acceptable. This is very good. So I should probably realign this again. So but first I would have to go through and level the, the bed again and make sure that's perfect. And that's, that's quite a process. And then I would have to adjust the head, but what I had to do was actually shim this. This sits on these two ways, and it's assumed that the thing is perfect, but it wasn't perfect. It was about uh, eight thousandths out in 12 inches. So I shimmed this here with try different shims. I think I ended up with like a 3,000 shim underneath this side of this way and a 1,000th on the back side of the other way, and it brought it into to a reasonable Tolerance. Uh, this is the first lathe that I've ever been able to get so that I can bore a cylinder, say, three inches, four inches deep, and I can't measure any taper whatsoever. I would always get like a half, a thousandth taper or something, and I'd have to hone it out. This thing will consistently bore a perfect cylinder to my measurements, and uh, that's, that's the one thing that I was looking for. So, all in all, the lathe is perfect for what I want. It has a variable speed, it's a quiet lathe, and I can drill up to a one inch hole on low speed, but I have to open it up. If you put a one inch drill in there and try to plow it through a piece of metal, it's going to stall the lathe. But I do drill up to one inch, and then I bore from there on out, and it's, you can bore any hole any size you want using the speeds. And uh, it does everything that I want it to do. Also another handy feature of this lathe is the fact that you can uh, Remove this cross slide very easily if you're doing some specialized job, and then put a, a face plate or something else here and mount your part to it, and you can bore uh, a line bore, a crankcase, or something else very easily. It's just loosen four bolts, take that off, bolt this down, square it. I use my alignment bar to square these, and uh, it works out pretty good. I've, I've done that three or four times in the past year. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention about this lathe is it was built during the height of COVID, and I'm sure that some of the factory workers that were in the factory at that time weren't the regular workers, so some of the, the little problems I had were probably due to the fact that it wasn't the normal guys that did it. It's a nice lathe and I'm very happy with it. So if this uh, was a useful video for you, uh, subscribe to my channel and give me a thumbs up. That's what uh, they grade us on and it helps us out and keeps us going. So uh, I'll see you in the next video.